why do we have prisons? Um, why do we build these things, these buildings? There are many different uh, terms for them. Um, reformatories, penitentiaries, you know, where people are reformed or they perform penitence um, to be fixed, to be cured of whatever it is that's wrong with them. Um, I used to go for drives in Eastern Canada, in the New Brunswick countryside, beautiful, 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 unspoiled countryside, um, farms and forests and rivers and lakes and trees and stuff like this. Um, and in one corner of New Brunswick, or in two corners of New Brunswick, there are these maximum security federal prisons. And, you know, I'd drive by sometimes at night and I'd look at them and they're uncanny looking places, seeing a maximum security prison especially at night when they were flood lit and everything. Um, and it gives you the, sh the chills to look at them. Because, you know, you can imagine what life is like for the people inside there. And this is in Canada, a place that's known for being a civilized country. Um, and, you know, all, all societies have prisons. But these are horrible places. Imagine spending your life in there, and people are deliberately put in there for life. Um... Why do we do this? Do we even ask ourselves why we do it? Um, is it for moral reasons? Are prisons places where we fix those who have something wrong with them? Or are they just garbage dumps? We don't know what to do with you, so we put you in this place and keep you away from everybody else. We just isolate you. We, you're beyond help or whatever. Um, what do we expect out of them? What do we expect to go on inside them? Um, I went to elementary school uh, when, when I was growing up. I, I went to this elementary school that was right next to another elementary school that had what has come to light as a serial pedophile as the basketball coach of that school. Um, preyed upon a large number of children, threatened his family with violence if they divulged anything, and then he died of a heart attack before he could go to trial. A lot of people are now wishing horrible things upon this individual and whatever afterlife may exist. Um, what is that? What is the... What will be the driving force behind someone wishing this upon this person? I would say this person has made others suffer, so now he must suffer. But other people who didn't suffer would probably be rather shocked if they examined their own motives, because, well, who knows what our motives are when we want to actually make another human being suffer? Do you trust your own motives? Or have you just alighted upon this fellow as somebody who you can legitimately act out your worst, most sadistic fantasies upon? at least vicariously, right? Um, there's a few real life examples of them. Like what if, for example, after the Second World War, you had a bunch of bona fide Nazi thugs in your hand, in your hands, in absolutely in your power. And these are not nice people. These are the sort that would beat, rape, or kill Jews just for no particular reason, or, or for the simple reason that um, they were in the way of some sort of grand social experiment like fascism or Nazism or something like this, uh, who had done all these things. They were Nazi fanatics or whatever, or whatever. Now you've got them in your power. What would you do? What do you think would happen? What would be justice there? <clears throat> if you want to, um, if it's punitive, if you're fighting evil, as it were, then any number of horrors could be legitimately visited upon these people, right? We have a real-life example of exactly that happening um, in post-war Romania. It was called the Pitești Experiment, where members of the Iron Guard, although they weren't all members of the Iron Guard, but the Iron Guard was this particularly brutal fascist militia that existed in Romania um, prior to and during the Second World War. And um, the communist regime, which had just fought this 40 million dead-causing war, 
just fought fascism uh, that resulted in 40 million corpses. That was an awkward way of phrasing it. Um, they now had some of the actual culprits who had contributed to bringing this situation about, consciously. What are we going to do with them? Well, let's reform them. Let's turn them into good communists. Or, these bastards basically committed the worst crime you could possibly imagine. Payback time. And in the Pateshti experiment, I'll leave a link below. It's, it's just not nice reading. But, you know, again, these horrible vignettes in history tell you something about how we deal with badness or whatever. The thinking went that these people were just plain evil. Because look at look what Nazism is. How, how do you get any closer to pure evil than Nazism? And these guys were Nazis. Um, and they were the thugs, the foot soldiers of Nazism that did the brutal grunt work of fascism and Nazism. They tortured people. They beat people up. They kicked people around in the streets, etc., etc. Now the war is over and we have a few of the culprits. We're going to try to reform them. And by reforming them, first we have to destroy their old personality, their old identity, their old um, whatever they were beforehand, because what they were beforehand was just plain evil. So to get the evil out of them, we have to resort to drastic measures, because we've just demonstrated that what they did is so evil that there's no rational, or I shouldn't say no rational response to it, but the most rational response to it uh, is to take monumentally drastic measures to change who they are won't go into detail, but they put Auschwitz and the Gulag in the shade in terms of human barbarism at Piteshti prison. The communist authorities who were overtly or ostensibly trying to fix some evil people. So, what, of course, what happened is um, the whole thing became corrupted by the idea that, well, if I'm acting against evil people, then the sky's the limit to what I can do to them. And, you know, I, no matter what I do to these individual people, it, it, it's as nothing compared to 40 million dead or 6 million Jews killed in the Holocaust or whatever. Um, these people are so heavily in debt that virtually anything we do to them is going to be shy of what they did and what they caused. So, really, they're so far in a deficit that whatever we do to them is okay. Um, and that's an interesting one, because axiomatically we do think that Nazis are pretty bad people. We think that people who would do that are pretty horrible. But when you fight these pretty horrible people, um, you end up, as Nietzsche said, gazing into the abyss, which then gazes back into you. You become exactly that which you supposedly abhor. Isn't this the problem with taking too much of a moral um, view or too much of a rational view, clinical view of human conduct? First of all, you've got this idea that these people have brought this upon themselves because of the depths of the depravities of their behavior during the war against Jews or anybody else who got in their way. Um... Secondly, you're actually trying to use scientific methods, even if they're crude and brutal, to turn them into good people. So who cares if we destroy them as people, if the end result is they become good people? Um, the whole point is to get the job done, right? It's just to go from A to B, to take this individual from being a monster and turn them into a good person. It's just aversion therapy taken to an extreme degree. You know, Ludovico's treatment in A Clockwork Orange. Um, <clears throat> kind of the counterpart to the sadistic and somewhat sexually repressed prison guard in A Clockwork Orange, right? Um, how does that fit into our view of dealing with things that we consider taboo? If things are that taboo, if things are that unacceptable, so you say a woman who has been raped is able to sort of confront her rapist who is now at her mercy. 
Um, think of the implications there. Uh, kind of the same idea, right? Um, and even that, that, this one kind of makes our skin crawl because even I sort of think, well, tough shit, buddy. You know, you raped her. She's now got razor blades and in her hands and iodine and stuff, and you're tied up, and she's got red hot pokers or electrical um, wires that she can apply to strategic places in your body. Too bad. Wait a minute. <laughs> what has just happened to me here? You know, on a, on a visceral level, I'm, have at her, girl. Do it. And is, you know, is this what I really want? Is this what I really want to, are, are the circumstances that, that then ensue, i.e. she tortures this guy who has raped her, is this what I want at the end of the day? Is this what she wants? Is this what will actually create a better world or whatever? Well, there's deterrent there. There's, um, there is some sort of payback. There's some sort of, um, um, balancing of accounts, I guess. Um, because if, you know, if you, if a society knows that rape is going to be punished so horrifically that we'll just lock you in a room, you're tied up and helpless with your victim and she's armed to the teeth with whatever she wants, a lot of people are going to think twice about raping somebody. Okay, that, that goes without saying, I guess. But also, it's almost as if we sublogically understand that the woman might have the need to do this to this guy in some way that we can't really explain. Um, this will make her whole, or so we think. Or is this just an understandable foible on her part? She kind of shouldn't do it, but we don't really want to prevent her from doing it because A, he kind of has it coming, and B, it she says at least that she wants to do that, that she wants to torture this guy back or whatever, in, in whatever way. Let's say that she doesn't want to physically torture him. She might want to destroy his sanity, uh, might want to sort of just brand a great big R on his forehead so for the end of his days, he walks around, everyone knows that he's a rapist. Um, whatever, whatever your chosen chastisement is of someone whom we believe has violated one of our greatest taboos, usually involves a further violation of taboo, right? How nice is it to brand a big R on somebody's forehead where they walk around an absolute leper for their entire life, meaning nothing but hatred and disdain from everybody? Well, they deserved it. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, how nice is that to do? Is that a nice thing to do? Is that a moral thing to do? Is that well, they violated our worst possible taboos. We can't allow that. We, we simply can't. I get it. We can't allow that. But is that a nice thing to do to that person? This is, I think, <clears throat> the blind spot that does get created by taboos. If you violate a taboo, you violated the absolute bedrock upon which we believe civilization rests. Ergo, you've stepped out of the law. You are now an outlaw. The rules do not apply to you anymore. Because you have actually abolished them yourself by your own actions. Ergo, we can sort of treat you as something completely outside of the normal human considerations. But isn't that taboo violation in and of itself? Isn't torturing somebody for months on end, somehow taboo as well? In this sense, I think taboos kind of feed off each other. And again, fighting monsters, uh, beware when fighting monsters, lest you should become a monster. And if you stare long into the abyss, the abyss stares back into you. Or another great aphorism from Nietzsche is, mistrust, upon, uh, mistrust all in whom the impulse to punish is strong. The impulse to punish the impulse to get even, the impulse to um, behave badly and then justify your bad behavior as righteous indignation or as um, retribution or as justice or whatever. I would say that 
when we're talking about, say, the Pateshti experiment, which is almost perfect for this kind of example, you've taken some very horrible people and you've done even worse things to them, apparently for the right reasons. And even the communist, even the Stalinist authorities in Romania concluded that this was absolute barbarism. Now, if you understand the depths to which Stalinism was prepared to go, to plumb, I guess, uh, and, and you end up disgusting the people who are torturers themselves to the point where the, a lot of the people who were running Pateshti prison were tried and executed afterwards by people who were essentially barbarians themselves, murderous, homicidal, sadistic maniacs, then tried people for being too homicidal, too sadistic, and too maniacal. Um, you know, it, it, isn't there something of a downward spiral that's taking place there? Um, it, does any of this result in a better world? Um, this is a pretty good argument, I would say, against revenge. Because if the point of, of punishing somebody, or the point of having revenge, is to create a better person, thus to create a better society, thus to make people more truly human, you don't get there by dehumanizing people, do you? But again, it's so easy to lose your way once you declare something is evil, once you declare something is just plain bad. Rather than, I would assume that the most rational thing to do is what the Russians usually did when they um, took over a concentration camp and when they liberated it. They just shot all the guards, just delete them from life. Um, the Russians were notoriously brutal in the Second World War, but it was a notoriously brutal war. But they didn't quite go to the extent that um, the, uh, the, the, the warders of the Pateshti prison were willing to go. But the interesting thing is, of course, a lot of what went on in Piteshti is kind of, in a nasty sense, what we would like to do to people who have violated our taboos. What will we do to those whom we believe have harmed us? And why? And what does that do to us? This is another big problem with taboos. Because when they are violated, we don't know what else to do but revert to barbarism ourselves.